If God exists, I don't think he sits around sinking people's little boats. I don't think he causes earthquakes and landslides or dreams up ways to make people's brakes fail. If there is a God, surely he's everywhere. He's in everything. He's even in this courtroom. He's in the sea. He's in a lobster. He's in a line of Robert Burns. He's in a woman's thigh, the soft anvil of creation. He's in a face. Happy heresies and welcome to the desert of the real. This is a Gnostic radio, an initiation by conversation into the dark corners of myth, magic, and meaning. A crash course in cult, culture, and conspiracy. A virtuous virus invoking and informing history, holiness, and heresy. Each week, I, your host Miguel Connor, commandeers your connection to bring the most accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. Fun, compelling, and deeply weird, this is the blow your mind cocktail party conversation you always wanted to listen in on, but we're often too afraid to do so because Daddy Jehovah and Mommy Gaia said you should stay in your room of complacency, normality, and bigotry. You should be seen and not heard, unless it's in some useless social media channel. And if you rebel, they will numb your soul and deploy their angels equipped with the neuralizer from Men in Black, or, I don't know, some amnesia narcotic from Kingsman. We can never see past the choices we don't understand. You ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake or still dreaming? But no more. It won't work. For you are the consummate soundtrack of the counterculture. So beautiful in so many ways for all eternity. And you're going to discover this, as well as new heroic dimensions of yourself you never thought you had. Like Carl Jung wrote, Your vision will become clear only when you look into your heart. Who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakens. And like another Gnostic saint, W.B. Yeats wrote, Whatever we build in the imagination will accomplish itself in the circumstances of our lives. Don't you see? It's not about you. It's about them. But I can't go back. Don't know that you got a choice, son. No man can walk out on his own story. It is said in the Gnostic Gospels, specifically the Christian Sethian ones, that the Demiurge's great sin, after he had formed the world from chaos, was that he claimed he was the only God and there was no God but him. This is obviously taken from Isaiah 45 in the Old Testament. Joseph Campbell agreed that was Yahweh's great sin inasmuch as he forgot he was a metaphor, blind to the infinite light of which he was a local historical manifestation. One scholar said that Yahweh's sin was actually monotheism, that monotheism was the darkening of the human condition, where the wondrous spirit world of levels of divinity and magical possibility were gradually shut down and all forces of the universe were centralized. (laughs) Kind of like a despotic government. You shall know that God is God and bow down to his will. Our own egos do that, become monotheistic blocking out all curiosity for the sublime and imaginative under the lash of our mechanical desires from a lizard brain dressed in Dawkins sensibility. That ends here at Aeon by Gnostic Radio. You see, in the Gnostic text, Sophia calls out from above all the heavens and tells the Demiurge, her own son, You are mistaken, Samael which means blind god in Greek. 
Sophia calls out for you now, and you have come to this show. No longer wanting to listen to your despotic ego and lizard brain that keep you chained to mediocrity and a hundred forms of fear. You are no longer blind as you come out of Plato's cave. I'm so glad you have manifested here at the virtual Alexandria to find all wondrous spirit world of levels of divinity and magical possibility and curiosity for the sublime and imaginative. It's a busy cosmos out there and we're going to find miracles in every breath you take. It's the weirdest thing. I feel like I've been in a coma for about 20 years and I'm just now waking up. So much wonder on this January, the year of our Demiurge 2017, as we are joined by Dr. Scott Kolbaba to discuss his book, Physicians Untold Stories, Miraculous Experiences Doctors Are Hesitant to Share with Their Patients or Anyone. We don't exactly focus on the science of near-death experiences and other alternative science happenings as we have on past shows, but take more of an inspirational approach. As Scott relates empirical but breathtaking stories of doctors and their experiences to the reality behind the reality. It's a bit of a departure for the show, but I thought Scott's message was important in this world of materialistic gods thinking that they're the only gods, and thought I'd give some love to a true seeker warrior from Chicago. For more information on the kind and wonderful Scott, please visit, you got it, Physicians Untold Stories. You want to see a miracle, son? Be the miracle. And please give some love to this show. If you find value in any content we put out, please consider becoming a supporter. I can't do it without you. In fact, I've changed the subscription model at our Arch of a Past Shows to a measly $5.99 a month. All for full access to all past episodes of Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. Over 350 with some of the best scholars and thinkers on Gnosticism and the Esoterica in the world. A hundred or more of these you will not find even at our iTunes or YouTube channels. No contract or minimum payment, but please consider this as also an avenue to support this red pill cafeteria that depends solely on your support. It's just $5.99 the price of a Westworld prostitute before she becomes conscious like all of us should and then kicks your ass. Just go to the God above God dad can for information on getting to our Arch of a Past shows. I gotta have more cowbell. Why, oh why didn't I take the blue pill? Beyond that, consider Patreon where you pay only when I produce content. If you just pledge a dollar show, it might cost you five bucks a month, as I produce about five pieces of content a month. And beyond that, there's always PayPal, my Amazon wish list, or Amazon affiliate list. If you want to know more about these forms of contribution, just email me at miguel at thegodabovegod.cam or go to thegodabovegod.cam your support solely keeps this red pill cafeteria open. We're going to do so many wonders together. Build a community of heretics that no longer is under the lash of a jealous god or lizard brains or just being so damn average. As Hemingway said, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. Thank you so much to those of you who support this blasphemy on a weekly basis. And thanks to my Brometheus Vance and my Brometheus Scott Smith, my webmaster elf queen Luthien, and all other podcasters out there who inspire the aeons, like Rune Soup, Talk Gnosis, Gnostic Warrior, Skeptico, THC, 
and even Gnostic media when Jan is gunning for Pizzagate. Thank you, and thank you for keeping this revolution going in the name of Hypatia of Alexandria. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. We're definitely going to do so many wonders together. Liberate Divine Sparks, one Val is pink bean at a time. It's a busy cosmos out there. Let us explore it. And let us to Scott Kobaba on Physician's Untold Stories. Write your own gospel, live your own myth. The rest will take care of itself. In the beginning, I imagined things would be perfectly balanced. He begged me not to let you people in. The money men. Tell us. But I told him we'd be fine, that you didn't understand what you were paying for. It's not a business venture, not a theme park, but an entire world. We designed every inch of it. Every blade of grass. And here we were gods, and you were merely our guests. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Scott Kolbaba to discuss his book, Physician's Untold Stories. How are you doing today, Scott? I'm doing great, Miguel. Thanks for coming on. So why don't we start uh, more or less with the beginning, how you came about to write the, the book. Tell us about your experiences and, again, uh, what led you to uh, get this book out. Well, I'm my day job is, is doctoring. I'm an internist uh, in Wheaton, Illinois, and uh, uh, I love my practice. I've been practicing here for about 35 years, but I had some strange experiences that made me think that there is something that I need to write down. And, and the, one of the first of those was a uh, individual, one of my patients, was vacation, or was traveling to uh, Louisiana. And uh, he called me up from Louisiana one night, and he said he was having uh, severe right upper ab- abdominal pain. And that's a common area where you have gallbladder uh, problems. And it sounded like it was his gallbladder, so I sent him to the emergency room. He had eaten a large meal, uh, nausea, abdominal pain, sounded classic gallbladder. Went to the emergency room. They did an ultrasound, blood tests, and everything was perfectly normal. So I thought, well, you know, uh, you know, he's feeling better. When he comes back, I I told him, uh, stop in the office. We'll do some tests and and figure out what's going on with you. So he came back, and indeed, he was having abdominal pain, like uh, advertised before. Nausea, wasn't feeling well, uh, and I did some fancier gallbladder tests thinking, you know, maybe they didn't do the right tests in in, uh, Louisiana, and I did some additional tests, blood tests, uh, uh, additional scans. Everything was perfectly normal, and it was very uh, disconcerting to to not know what was going on with them. So uh, a couple days later, I woke up in the morning, early in the morning, and I had the, the strange feeling that he needed the lung scan. Now, it didn't make um, uh, any sense that he needed a lung scan because this was abdominal pain. And I was a little embarrassed to call him up and say, you know, I have this strong feeling you need a lung scan. And so uh, he said, well, I'm, I can't have it today because I'm flying out to Denver. And so I said, um, you know, uh, I, I really have a strong feeling. Uh, what time is your flight? And he said, well, it's at 2 o'clock. And I said, if I, you can, if I can get the lung scan in this morning, could you go? And he hemmed and hawed, and I was very quiet. And finally, he said, "Okay, uh, I, you know, if you can get the lung scan in." So I called the hospital, and I said, "I'd like to get a lung scan in this morning." And they they kind of laughed because their lung scan, their their, their radiology procedures were scheduled out a couple of days in advance. So I was very quiet. And after about uh, 20 seconds of a pregnant pause, the radiologist on the other end of the line said, "Okay, send him over." So uh, I called Taylor and sent he went over to the hospital, and I got a lung scan. And about uh, uh, an hour later, I got a call from the radiologist, and he said to me, good call. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, uh, Taylor had a massive pulmonary embolus on his diaphragm, which is why he had abdominal pain, not chest pain. You made a great call. Had he flown out today, he probably would have died because he probably would have had other uh, uh, emboli 
his lungs. And so I got goosebumps when I, when I heard that. And I thought, there's something, there's something out there that, that uh, directed me to do this. And I, I couldn't explain it scientifically. It just didn't make any sense at all. And so I tucked that in the back of my hat and thought about it for a while and uh, didn't think anything, you know, anything more about that. You know, you have coincidences, you have funny things that happen to you. And then one day I was making rounds on the fourth floor of our hospital and one of my orthopedic surgeons literally ran up to me and grabbed me by the arm and said, Scott, Scott, I've got to tell you this amazing story. And I said, okay, tell it to me. And he said, well, I can't tell you right here. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, someone might hear me. And this is an ordinary, you know, uh, orthopedic surgeon who, um, uh, you know, is not a strange individual at all. He's just a, a regular doc that, that uh, does lots of surgeries. He said, we have to go into an, a, a room where, where no one can hear us. So I said, okay. I was wondering, you know, this is really strange. And I said, who have you told this story to after we got in the room and he closed the door? And he said, well, no one. I told my family, but that's it. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, they'll think I'm crazy if I tell anyone this story. And so it was a mutual patient. And evidently what, was ha what happened is that he was operating on her ankle. Uh, Mary is her name. And Mary had a significant ankle problem. And uh, during the operation, they gave her some antibiotic. And when they did, she arrested, flatlined. No heartbeat, no respirations, eyes closed, dead. And so they called a code. And when they call a code in the ER, or in the op operating room, I should say, everyone runs in from the rooms around and starts to help out. And one of the fellows that ran in to, to uh, take over uh, the CPR compressions was a fellow with bright red hair and a, underneath his uh, surgical cap. And so he decided to do CPR and, and compressions. Now, Dr. Mokel, who was the attending surgeon, was in charge of the code. And, and they, they weren't generating a pulse. They weren't uh, compressing her, her heart enough to generate a pulse. And, and so he needed to, to make sure that that was being done properly. So he asked the fellow with the red hair to step aside. Well, he didn't step aside. He asked him again. Now, you have to realize in the heat of the battle here, codes are life and death situations. You're not polite. You, you have to get the job done. So Dr. Mokel stepped over and gave the guy a push and <laughs> pushed him aside. He stumbled away, and Dr. Mokel took over and started to do CPR compressions, which she did adequately. They gave her uh, Mary some uh, intravenous medications, and she came around. Uh, but she never woke up until the next day. But she, her heart started to, to come back again, and she came around. And so uh, the cardiologist took over. They studied the whole situation. It looked like it was just a reaction to the antibiotic. It wasn't an intrinsic heart disease or anything else. So after a couple of days, Mary was ready to go home, and Dr. Mokel came in to give her the final instructions for taking care of her ankle, which they never did fix. And uh, Mary said, thank you for saving my life. And, and Dr. Mokel, Dave Mokel said, you know, it was just a, a, a team effort. You know, we all chipped in and, and, and Mary said, interrupted him. And she said, no, no, I saw you save my life. And Dave said, well, you know, what do you mean? And she said, well, I saw you push the guy with the red hair aside and I saw him stumble away from the, from the uh, table. I saw you do the chest compressions and that's what that got me going again. And Dave, by this point, was weak-kneed because he didn't know what to say, and he sat down. And uh, he said, well, you know, how did you know that? And she said, well, when I, when I arrested, when I, when I died, basically, on the table, I rose up to the top of the room, and I was watching everything else that was happening. And I saw you page Dr. Kolbaba, although I wasn't in the hospital. He paged me, kept looking at the door for me to come in. Uh, she mentioned multiple little details uh, that no one would ever have, have observed unless they had been right there looking at the whole scene from above. And so Dave, uh, you know, who's a scientific man, scient a scientist, was trying to explain this scientifically, and he just couldn't. And uh, he, he, uh, he had to tell me. And he also mentioned that when Mary was, was in this situation, uh, her grandmother came to her, who had been dead for a long, a long time. And the grandmother told Mary that she uh, had a special place in heaven that she'd go to if she was kind and considerate the rest of her life. Now, Mary... It was kind of a curmudgeon, you know. She was she was never a nice, a very nice person. <laughs> but after this arrest and after her episode, she was the kindest and nicest individual. She had a, a widowed father. She took care of. Uh, every time I saw her in the office, she was kind and considerate and unbelievable. And she lived for a number of years. She was had lots of medical problems, so she didn't live a long life. But she was the kindest and nicest person. So Dave Mokel got me thinking about uh, maybe there are other docs that have these same kinds of experiences. These are really unusual, and, and, and he wasn't a, 
you know, anyone that was uh, out of the ordinary, just an ordinary work-a-day doc. So I started to ask other doctors. Have they had any experiences that they, that they couldn't explain scientifically? And I was really amazed that there were lots of doctors that came forward with stories that gave me goosebumps or made me tear up. And uh, that was my criteria for including those stories in the book. If they gave me goosebumps and were so so interesting and so unusual or made me tear up and for, with emotion, I included those stories. And I've got about 30 stories in the book and then the bios of the doctors. And that's 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 a long answer to a short question of how I got started. And I, it was going to be a six-month project. And uh, you can tell I'm a very inexperienced writer because thinking six months I'd finish a book would be crazy. And it took me about four, almost four years to finish the book. But I did finish it. And uh, it's got some really amazing stories of, of these doctors' experiences. I would agree, Scott. Uh, yeah, amazing stories of all kinds and uh, different ones. And uh, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. And uh, as far as you know, it's, I mean, it's such a varied group of doctors and even in different places of the world as far as Africa and all that. Yes. Do, do the doctors or anybody really understand what forces are behind these? I mean, again, it seems like a, a premonition, a gut feeling sometimes is what gets them going, right? Yes. I, I think most doctors, uh, and, you know, some, and, and these are all very, as you mentioned, all very doctors with various, various specialties and in various parts of the world. They all believe that there's something higher than, than us. There's some kind of force. There's something above us. And most of the doctors call that force God. And um, uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, push religion very much. I just told stories in the book. But uh, most of the doctors were convinced that, that they had been directed uh, by the hand of God or, or some universal force that, uh, uh, that loves us and, and looks out for us and, and participates in our lives sometimes every day. And I'm sure even then it must be pretty frustrating. I think there's one story. Uh, they all struck me, but this one struck me hard about... Uh, a gentleman jumping in the car and the driver telling him just out of nowhere, don't put on your seatbelt. Yes. And they get in a wreck and he would have died if he put on his seatbelt. I think my brother had that experience once he had in a wreck and the cops told him, good thing you didn't have your seatbelt because the driver's side was crushed. But the the happened. driver passed away. I mean, some, some things like yes. that must be frustrating because you're still sort of confounded. Yes. Well, he had an interesting dream. Uh, he thinks it was a dream the night before where he was told that he'll be okay. And he didn't know the, the meaning of that dream uh, until the next day, obviously. And when he woke up, it was still it was still with him. You know, when you wake up, most of the time dreams kind of drift off uh, in a few seconds. You've forgotten all your dreams if you had any. But this one stuck with him. It, it was a very vivid dream. And um, the dream was that he would not be hurt. And indeed, uh, the driver of the car, uh, who they were all drinking that night, and the driver got a little crazy, and uh, they went around a, a curb, a curve too quickly, and the the uh, car turned over, and the driver was thrown out of the car. The passenger, who's our, our our doctor that wrote the story, then was forced over to the other side into the driver's seat, and uh, when the car came to a stop upside down. He looked over to where he was sitting, and the the, the driver, the passenger seat was crushed by the by the roof. And had he been uh, uh, sitting there, he would have been crushed. And it's interesting that the driver said to him uh, before, just before he was thrown out of the car and, and killed, he said, "Don't buckle." And that you know that just gave me goosebumps re just hearing that that story uh, and uh, how he was literally saved. And and there was a it had a premonition the night before in that dream. Why do you think uh, these 30 ordinary practicing physicians uh, risk their reputation to come forward with these amazing stories? I mean, as we both know, the science community, is that's not something they want to deal with, premonition, coincidences, and all that. So how has it been received, and how have been the uh, contributors being treated, including yourself? You know, I, I was shocked. I literally was shocked that these ordinary doctors would, would, would come together with with these stories, would come out with these stories and allow me to publish them. And so I, I thought for a long time about what, what, their, what their motive is. What, why would an ordinary doctor who's got a very successful, these are all successful doctors. They have a successful practice all over the world. And some, you know, some are missionaries, some are, are you know, doctors in, in private practice, some are group practice. 
And I thought to myself, there's a couple of things that, that I could come up with. I've been around for a long time. Uh, I've been around for about 30 years in private practice, and they know me, and they trust me. I, I, uh, I'm a pretty straight shooter. And so that was, I think, w one of the, one of the uh, things that, that uh, they took into consideration. The other one was there, there are lots of doctors contributing stories. So they, they weren't alone. They weren't the only person in the, in the hospital contributing a story, an unusual story to this book. But I think the third one is very interesting. The third one is really, I think, the crux of uh, what doctors are all about, and, and that's why they, they did this. And I, th I called it in the book, I called doctors sappy do-gooders because these are people that my, my editor called them the noble doctors because they want to do some good in the world every day. They want to help someone. They, they went into medicine to, to do some good. And I think they recognized that this country and this world is changing a lot. And they wanted people to know that there's something else out there. There's something that loves us. And I think if we believe in something, we're better people. We do more good in the world. And I think that's what the message that they wanted to convey uh, through telling these stories. And I think that was the overwhelm, overriding uh, uh, premise for why they really stuck their necks out to, to tell me these really unusual stories. Now, the second part of that question was, you know, what's happened to them? What's happened to me? Um, it really, I, I didn't know what would happen. I, I thought we'd be criticized. I thought we'd be, um, uh, you know, people would, would leave my practice. Just the opposite. Uh, and it's amazing. Each of the doctors is getting laudits for coming uh, out with, with stories like this and, and uh, you know, helping uh, people believe that there is something else out there that these scientists uh, have, have recognized that's, that's beyond science. And so I, I had one doc who uh, was anonymous in the book. He didn't want him, uh, himself to be, to be uh, mentioned. And after he saw all the, the, the notoriety that these doctors <laughs> were getting from being in the book, he said, no, no, I want, to, I want to be named also. I want to be part of this club. And that was kind of fun uh, to see that. So I think the, uh, the, the overwhelming impression has been these are, these are good stories uh, uh, and, and um, uh, people like, like them. And, and, and the doctors have gotten uh, some, some laudits uh, for, for coming out and, and, and uh, telling their stories. That's certainly good to hear. And I mean, I don't think we even have to say that what happened is unscientific. I mean, on this show and in other shows, and certainly there is science that discusses uh, the ideas of near-death experience, out-of-body experiences, premonition, dream works, and all that. So the science is out there. And I'm sure have you uh, now explored some of this science and seen that it is pretty sound? You know, I have. It, it's interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm a busy doc. I don't do a ton of reading on things, and um, I don't have much time. I've got seven kids that keep me busy, and, and so I'm, I'm usually pretty busy, and every time I, I get some leisure time, it's, it's not reading. But, but um, what I've discovered after writing the book is, is there are lots of stories out there uh, that are almost identical to the kinds of stories that, that the doctors wrote, and I didn't know that. Uh, their their, their near-death experiences are very similar the dreams, the premonitions, and it makes you real. It makes you believe that that indeed uh, the force, the God that is is causing causing this or or, or contributing to to the uh, to these individuals and helping them in their work and helping them in their lives, is is doing this all over the world, and and the stories are similar, which is very interesting to me. Now that I'm getting into it and reading about it more and more. How do you see, a lot, your book deals a lot with dreams. Maybe you could uh, tell the listener more about some of the experiences you've had or some of these doctors have had with dreams. Sure, sure. Uh, there are a number of dreams in the book. I think um, you know, one of the most uh, impressive was uh, one of my friends, Rich Jorgensen, who's a, uh, a general surgeon. And um, Rich uh, uh, had a dream. He has a, had a friend who was a, a judge, Judge Glasso. He was an appellate judge, a very prominent judge, and uh, he was good friends with him. And he had a dream one night that Judge Glasso had died of a heart attack, and it was a very vivid dream. He saw him in the coffin in the funeral home. It was just one of those dreams that when you wake up, you, you, don't, you don't forget. It was so vivid. And a few months before that, he had a conversation with a, a woman that, that believed that, that the Earth Spirit uh, communicates to us through dreams. And she, she told him that the Indians used to believe that, uh, the American Indians used to believe that if, if you had a, 
a dream, you should tell the person you're dreaming about because that was the way this, quote, earth spirit communicated uh, with us. And so Rich, you know, was a little hesitant to call him up and, and say, you know, listen, uh, Judge, I saw you in a coffin dead. <laughs> The first thing that the judge did was was kind of laugh it off. You know, how, what what are you going to say to that? Uh, one, of, one of your best friends says you, he saw you dead in the coffin. And so um, uh, so, Rich said, you know, it was such a vivid dream. You really need to go to a doctor and, and get checked out and just make sure that you're healthy. And he did that. He said, that's fine. I haven't seen you know a doctor for a long time. I'll go get my physical. And he got a complete physical. He got everything done, EKG and chest X-ray labs and complete examination. And, and the doctor that saw him said, you're perfectly healthy. Uh, don't listen to this crazy doctor's dream, uh, and and um, you know, go about your life, and 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 you'll you'll be fine. So he, uh, the judge called Dr. Jorgensen back and said, you know, I, I did my physical, and everything's fine. Are you happy now? And uh, Dr. Jorgensen said, you know, he had that he had that sick feeling in his stomach again because he 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 knew that there was something going on here that he had to he had to speak up, and so he said, you know. I'd like you to see my cardiologist, just in case, just just for one a second opinion. And the judge said, "No, oh, come on, Rich. I, I just had my physical. I'm a busy guy. I don't have time to be running around." And and Rich really had to twist his arm. He he stuck his neck out to to twist his arm to to get another examination by the cardiologist. Well, the cardiologist did a stress test, which the judge flunked very badly. Put him right in the hospital. Did an angiogram. The angiogram showed what's called a widowmaker plus multiple other coronary lesions. They were so afraid that it was uh, such a critical lesion there that they operated on him the next day with a, a bypass and sa literally saved his life. Widowmakers generally are, are fatal uh, conditions, and the life expectancy uh, uh, with a widowmaker is usually between three and six months. So that dream literally saved, saved his life, and that was an amazing dream. You mentioned uh, that one of the doctors, when in training, always had a fluttering light, either in a dream or during the day when someone on their service was going to die. Could you tell us about that, Scott? Yeah, this was Noemi Sigalov, who's uh, emigrated from Romania. And uh, she had an interesting uh, experience uh, living in communist Romania with the Secret Service chasing her and things like that. But but when she came to this country, she uh, she excelled at, at education and, and wanted to become a, a surgeon, and she, and she did. And on the surgical residency program, uh, she invariably, you know, they had a, this is a pretty sick service. There are lots of people that had been shot, had been run over. This is a trauma service. And, and so these people were, were literally at death's door much of the time. And, and so they lost a, a number of people on their service, uh, which was not, wasn't unusual because of the severity of their illnesses. And every time uh, there was that someone was going to die that day, she would either in a dream or wake up or in the shower or sometime have this fluttering, like a feather fluttering in the in the peripheral peripheral of her vision, and and she she came to dread that because she didn't want to know that someone was going to die. And and when she told the other surgical residents this this story, you know they 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 knew it was true. And they dreaded hearing her come in with that because they knew that that uh, that uh, warned of, of someone's someone's death, and it was invariably the case. Now it didn't happen with every single death, but it happened enough times that uh, she began to dread having that that vision, and uh, it was it was amazing that 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 was the case. I don't think she's had it since her residency, but that was very prominent for her at, at that time. And Scott, what about talking to the dead? Uh, tell us about some examples of doctors or patients and how ancestors or the dead came through to uh, give them information. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a number of, of, of stories that I have about, about uh, people coming back and, and helping those that, that are still with us. And um, I think probably, uh, in thinking about this, the most, the most significant one is, is Grandma Hanlon. Grandma Hanlon was a, a, a little old lady that uh, was a midwife. And Grandma Hanlon started out in, in Ireland uh, where she was a young girl. And at the time, uh, the Protestants and the Catholics were, were battling uh, each other. And her father was a Catholic, and he was hiding uh, Irish uh, priests in his secret rooms in their house. And it was a dangerous time, so he sent uh, Grandma Hanlon to this country to grow up, and, and uh, she, she lived here. She got married. 
she became a midwife delivering babies and and uh, she was a really a, a spiritual example to the whole family she would do things like uh, uh, if the a family couldn't afford to, to pay for her services she'd do it for free she would go downtown uh, many times and take the train and, and there were there were people on the street people that would be begging and she'd have money or food or something for them and people would laugh at her and they'd say you know don't you know that these people will spend it for alcohol and she would say you know, uh, my job uh, is to, to give them uh, some help wherever I can, and that's what the Lord would want me to do. What they do with the money is, is their thing. And so she really became, a, a, this, like I said, the spiritual uh, guide for the, for the whole family. And after she got old, uh, she uh, had to live with her daughter and her granddaughter. Now, the granddaughter is Joan, uh, who is uh, Dr. Heitzler's wife, Joan, Joan Heitzler. And... Um, uh, Joan, when she was a little girl, uh, loved Grandma Hanlon. They loved each other dearly. And Joan would say if she got in trouble with her mom, if she made it to Grandma Hanlon's lap, she knew she'd be safe. <laughs> so so <laughs> th they were great, great friends. And um, Joan was delivering their uh, – Joan obviously grew up and got married to Dr. Heitzler, who tells the story. And Joan was delivering their fifth child. And uh, after the delivery uh, – Joan uh, uh, was in quite a, a bit of pain. And in those days, one of the drugs that they would give for, for uh, pain in, in the delivery room was a drug called Trilene. Now, Trilene is administered by mask. And so what they do is they put the mask over the person's face, they uh, breathe in the Trilene, and they fall asleep into a deep sleep. And they obviously are in no pain at, at that point. So uh, Joan was in a fair amount of pain, so they... they got out the trilene, we're ready to put the mask over her face, and in walks Grandma Hanlon. The, the, uh, there, now, there are two uh, obstetricians. This is an obstetrician's wife being delivered, so the nurses are extra careful. There's two obstetricians in, in the room, and Grandma Hanlon, the midwife, walks in. She's got a polka dot dress on. She's got the hair up in the bun like she always did, did and she had a, a, a little white sweater vest on and, and then old grandmother's shoes. And she stood at the, the foot of the bed, and she, she shook her head. She said, uh, no, Joan, don't don't you don't do the trilene. She shook she shook her head back and forth, and Joan knew what she meant, and so she pushed the trilene away and didn't take it. Now no one knew and no one asked or remembered that Joan had eaten a very large meal right before the delivery, and no one knew that. And um, about two minutes after Joan pushed the trilene away, she vomited the entire meal. Now had she been unconscious with the mask on, she probably would have aspirated and may have died from from aspiration pneumonia. So um, uh, Grandma Hanlon slipped out of the room uh, unnoticed by anyone else after she literally saved Joan's life. And Joan, the love between Joan and Grandma Hanlon transcended uh, all bounds of, of uh, time and space because Joan had made it back to Grandma Hanlon's lap one more time. The interesting thing is Grandma Hanlon had died 22 years before. Wow, what a story. And uh, again, what I'm getting is all these... Uh figures, dead or alive, really uh, gave their service to a higher power, to the forces of good in their life, and they were all full of very unconditional love. That seems to be the commonality, right, Scott? I, th I think it was. I think uh, in, in looking at these stories, you know, when you write a book like this, this is just an anthology of stories, and you never know what the main theme is going to be when you just put a bunch of stories together. But, uh, you know, in, in analyzing this... Um, I think that the theme of this is is love. Uh, love is a universal force. I think it's the great. I think it's the the strongest force uh, in the universe. And I think this was just the Grandma Hanlon story is just one example of how love can overcome all forces of time and space and and uh, and even death. Uh, and it was uh, that's a recurrent theme I think in in the whole book in one in one way or another. Love, love between family members, uh, love uh, for God. Uh, love between friends. Uh, I, I think that became a, a very interesting theme. And, and to me, um, uh, the bottom line is that love is, is the most powerful force in the universe. And what about prayer? I mean, it's no secret to the listeners that I'm a big fan of prayer. Probably don't do it enough as I, I should, along with other spiritual practices. But uh, tell us, Scott, about your experience with prayer and what stories did the doctors relate to you? There's a number of great stories about prayer. I think um, the one that, uh, I'll tell you one that happened to me, actually, with, with prayer. 
And and uh, this happened in uh, uh, Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix. Have you been through Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix ever? No, I haven't, Scott. Okay, it's a it's a modest modest size airport, and and this was uh, a Sunday night. Um, and I I have I have three kids that live in Phoenix, so I love to go visit the kids. And you know I can take off on a Friday night and come back on a Sunday night, and it's like I've been away for months. It's it's a lot of fun to do that. But you have to be careful and make sure you get back on Sunday night and uh, for work the next day. <laughs> now, this particular uh, weekend, uh, it was a great weekend with my family and my partner, uh, Dr. Bourne, uh, who was leaving for uh, a cruise the next morning. So I knew I had to be back in town. Uh, otherwise, he, he couldn't go on his cruise. So I'm... It was a great weekend. I'm Sunday night. I'm walking into the airport, Sky Harbor Airport, and looking at my boarding. I'm looking at my passes and my tickets and so forth. And I am incredibly careful with. Uh, I, I'm I'm compulsive uh, to the nth degree, and when it when it comes to making reservations and making sure that the right date and the time and so forth, and we're flying to the right city. And I've never made a mistake except once. And that was when I uh, was in Phoenix, and I was as I was walking to the Sky Harbor Airport, I looked at the ticket, and the ticket said Monday night and not Sunday night. And I got goosebumps, and I thought, oh, no, I, I have to change this right away, because if I don't get back, my partner's not going to be able to go on his cruise, and he's going to be really, really upset with me. So I uh, checked in at the, at the ticket counter, and the, the agent said, well, you, I, it's too late now. You have to go to the ticket counter, or to, uh, to the um, boarding gate, where, the, uh, where they'll, they'll change your, your dates and, and so forth. So I got to the, to, the, to the gate, and I went up to the ticket counter, and I said, you know, I've got the ticket to fly out on, on um, Monday night, and I really need to fly out tonight. It's really important because my partner and I told the whole story, and... and uh, they said, well, you see those people right behind you? Uh, those are uh, eight people that are ahead of you uh, waiting to, to change their flights also. And you're going to be number nine in, in, this, in this queue. So I'm not sure you know, we're going to be able to do anything with you. And I, oh, I got sick to my stomach. And I thought, what am I going to tell them? I'm trying to come up with scenarios, truthful or, truthful or not, uh, to tell my partner about what <laughs> happened to me. And so... Um, then the, the next insult hit, and, and that was uh, they announced over the PA system, the flight is in a sold, o- oversold condition. We're offering $200 for anyone to give up their ticket. And I thought, oh, no, I'm really a dead duck now. I've got eight people ahead of me. They're in an over, oversold situation. I'll never get on this flight. My partner won't be able to go on vacation, and that'll be a really bad scene. So I waited a few more minutes with this uh, set, uh, this hapless group of eight others uh, that were standing around uh, waiting to see if anything happened. And then the next thing that came on the PA system was we're now offering $300 plus a free flight for anyone <laughs> that wants to give up their ticket. And people uh, evidently had given up their tickets and, and uh, they finally the flight was totally filled. And I was just devastated. I didn't know what to do. So I went to the uh, little little seat in the corner of the of the uh, this little uh, uh, area by the ticket counter and I bowed my head and I said Heavenly Father I know this is not a life changing situation I know that there are other things that are more important than this in the world but this is really important to me that I get on this flight please do whatever you can to help me and I'll and I'll um, be forever uh, 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 in, in debt and I'll I'll, I'll uh, do anything that, that you'd want me to do to, to, uh, to accomplish this. Amen. And so um, and then I got up, and, and uh, I, I could see the eight hapless uh, ticket holders were starting to walk away from the, the, the counter. They were boarding the plane. The plane was fully boarded, and they were getting ready to close the, the door, uh, you know, that goes to the, to the boarding ramp, to goes to the, that goes to the plane. And I thought, oh, I don't know what I'm going to tell my partner. And all of a sudden, this little angelic voice uh, comes up and, and uh, from almost nowhere and says, Mr. Kobaba, you better get your boarding pass. The gate's closing. And I looked around, and there was a, a lady at the ticket counter holding a boarding pass with an outstretched hand. I took off as fast as I can like an athlete grabbing a baton, grabbed the boarding pass, ran to the door just as it was closing and got onto the plane. I was going to ask her how that how this happened when they were in an oversold situation. Eight others were ahead of me, and I got the boarding pass, but I, I didn't have to ask. 
I knew what I knew the answer to that. To that, I knew what happened. I think uh, I think God had, had answered a prayer, and I got on the board. I got on that plane and and made it back uh, in time. And uh, that was pretty impressive to me. I, it, it's a really a faith a faith builder. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, yeah, like you said, it uh, makes you look at the world in a different way. And when speaking of these, there's always instances in, instances in life when figures appear and they're almost like angels and sometimes it seems to be angels because you look around and they're gone or somehow they seem dreamlike in a scenario are there any of those in the book yeah there were a couple of instances of that in in the book um probably um the one that was uh, most significant was uh, uh, noemi sigalov again we talked about her before with the fluttering she seems to be pretty connected to the spiritual world. I think her her uh, veil is a little bit thinner than most of ours, perhaps. And she took care of a couple missionaries, doctor missionaries from from Africa, and um, they were really kind and nice people. And they'd come back periodically to raise money for their mission uh, in in uh, Africa. And they took took care of the uh, the, the Africans uh, in all whatever medical conditions they had. There was a husband and wife team. And every time they, uh, she had some medical problems that Dr. Siegelhoff uh, uh, took care of. And every time they were in the office, uh, they would they would ask her, you know, how is her faith? And and uh, and Dr. Siegelhoff, uh, you know, wasn't a, a real strongly religious person at the time. She, uh, I don't think she went to church. But they would always always, you know, show her their love. And and the missionary couple would say, you know, uh, we really, you know, you really need to to believe in something. You need to read some scriptures. And and um, you know, and the husband uh, would say to her, "Someday uh, I will show you uh, that there is life beyond uh, this world, and and that that uh, we we do go to heaven, and that there is something uh, else." And and Dr. Siegelov, you know, that's nice. I'm, I'm, you know, thanks for caring about me and so forth. And so uh, Dr. Siegelov had a um, a vacation planned, and and um, she was. Um, uh, uh, Trying to get out of, out of uh, the, the the town to go to Tucson, I think is where the vacation was, and she had to make very early morning rounds. And um, when she uh, got into the hospital, uh, as the doors opened, there was a whiff of air that was a little unusual uh, as she walked in through the doors. And in her mind's eye, she saw this missionary, this this male uh, doctor missionary, uh, in her mind's eye, and and she could see on his face was an expression of it was like overwhelming satisfaction that he had accomplished something that he always wanted to accomplish. And and she was so taken aback by this that she she said, well, hello, hello there. And she, she startled herself actually in saying that. And she looked around to see if anyone had heard her and no one was there because it was so early in the morning. And then the, the, the vision disappeared and she went on her rounds and then she went to her, her, her air, air flight and, and got to Tucson. And you know, whenever she's on vacation, she likes to shut off her e- email and everything else because that way she can enjoy herself. But on the way back, about three days later, she uh, got with to I think it was the airport, and um, she turned on her email again and, and was reading her email. And 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 she, when she read one particular email from the hospital, she got goosebumps because the email read, "We regret to announce uh, the death." of our great missionary friend, and they named the, the person that the, the, the male, the, the missionary that she knew, had died the morning that she made her rounds. And uh, wow. he evidently had appeared to her on that morning uh, of, of, uh, of his death. And the expre- she realized the expression on his face was the ultimate... I get, I get choked up a little bit when I tell the story. It's an amazing story. The, 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 the expression amazing. on his face she said, was um, as if he had accomplished the ultimate missionary moment of his life, that he had proved to her there was something beyond this life. Yeah, very. that's very powerful, and uh, certainly some experiences in my life, and I think if listeners uh, pay attention, has happened in their lives. I think it's, uh, it's a busy universe. And uh, But the question would be, you've mentioned, Scott, um, the fluttering lights, the dreams, uh, Indian practices. 
what advice would you have for people to sort of listen to that inner voice or that higher voice? I mean, uh, it's so easy to second guess yourself when you're going through life and say, well, uh, I had too much coffee or I'm just hearing things. Uh, what advice do you have for people to say, hey, listen, this can make a difference? Yeah, a couple pieces of advice. And, and one is what, what's very interesting to me that when people have read this book, they come back to me and say, you know, I never realized the coincidence that I had was more than a coincidence. And, and that, um, you know, maybe there is something that uh, directed me to have this individual uh, show up on the elevator at the same time I was there. And he's the one that got me the job and advanced my career and so forth. So, so people, people are realizing uh, when they read some of these stories that these things happen to them and they happen on a regular basis. And so my, my advice um, to, to people uh, that are listening and people that are reading the book is pay attention to those things. Those, uh, the things, that little voice that you hear in the back of your head, uh, you know, may, may be a significant thing. Don't, don't, don't uh, disregard, don't, don't uh, disregard that. Think, think uh, someone uh, is trying to communicate with you sometimes and there are amazing things that happen to us all the time. Pay attention to the little coincidences in your life and realize they're not necessarily coincidental, that there's some, there's a purpose in, in these things. My partner, John Bourne, uh, uh, is a great proponent of this. He had a patient that was going to, to surgery, and he had to uh, do a pre-op on the, on the patient and clear him for surgery, and he cleared him for surgery. And then this little voice came to him afterwards, and, and it said to him, you know, this guy uh, needs a stress test. And uh, he tried to ignore it a little bit, but, you know, John's learned that uh, when he hears that voice, he, he doesn't ignore it for very, very long. And, and um, uh, so he called the individual up and said, you need a stress test. We need, to, we need to sort this out before you go to surgery. And the guy was pretty resistant. And uh, John finally said, well, if you don't have the stress test, you're not, I'm not going to clear it for surgery. So he, the, he went for a stress test. He flunked it, uh, had a bypass surgery, uh, which probably saved his life again. And... Um, uh, went on then to have the, the total joint surgery that uh, he was uh, being cleared for. But uh, uh, this little voice in Dr. Bourne's mind uh, uh, probably saved his life. So my advice to, to, to everyone is listen to those little voices. Listen to the things, uh, the little uh, hunches that you get. And, and watch out for your coincidences because they may be telling you something that is important for you and for those around you. Well said, and well said, and it seems to me, Scott, that uh, part of the equation sometimes is uh, great moments of stress or life-threatening situations that seem to open our channels of communication when we're desperate or uh, or something like that. So it seems physicians of all of, of all uh, professions or parts of society should have that sort of third eye, right? Yes, I, I, yeah, I agree. And and things do come up under under great great stress. Things that uh, you don't expect. Uh, I've got a story. Uh, I could tell the story about Dr. Geezer and the and the kidney, if you like. That's a uh, please do yes. D Dave Geezer is um, uh, an ophthalmologist that specializes in glaucoma. He's also chairman of of the board of Wheaton College, and he had an experience when he was uh, in high school, and he was a goalie for his, uh, his uh, high school soccer team. And they were playing a, a soccer uh, practice. And uh, he jumped out in front of the, the ball to stop the ball from going into the goal when the uh, forward was running toward him and was kicking and, and uh, missed the ball and, and kicked uh, Dr. Geeser, Dave Geeser, right in the flank, right in the kidney. Well, it ruptured his kidney, and uh, Dave was in excruciating pain. Went to the hospital, uh, was there for a number of days, uh, in excruciating pain. He was in such pain he, he couldn't even watch TV. He was just laying in bed. And um, uh, his uh, urologist finally decided that his, it was time to take his kidney out, to remove his kidney. And so they, um, they got a hold of his father, who was in, in uh, Switzerland at the time on business, and had him come back from Switzerland. And um, he was all set to, to get his kidney taken out, uh, I think, on a, on a Monday. This was a Friday. He had the, the episode was on a Monday or Tuesday when he was kicked. And so uh, Dave, because he wasn't able to watch TV or do anything because of the pain, was, was just lying in bed and was watching the clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, exactly, the pain disappeared. And he, he, was, he was 
a, a little bit afraid of even moving in bed because he thought the pain would come back. But he inched over to the left, no pain. Inched over to the right, no pain. Then he did the ultimate. He sat up, no pain at all. He got out of bed, walked around, pain was gone. Went to the bathroom where he had been urinating blood the whole time because of the ruptured kidney, no blood in the urine. And so the doctor, when he saw him the next day, discharged him. He was, he was fine. And he spent another week or so at home recovering. He went back to school, to high school, and um, everyone was glad to see him. And one of his, uh, one of his favorite teachers uh, took him aside and said, you know, we were really, really concerned about you. And on that Friday after you were injured, we decided to have a faculty prayer at passing hour, which was 10 o'clock. And we said a, a faculty prayer for you at 10 o'clock. And Dave got goosebumps when he heard the time because that's the exact time that his pain suddenly disappeared. And he knew then uh, that there was, there was a God, that there was something higher, uh, and that has stayed with him his entire life. And that has strengthened his faith and uh, made him a, a great believer and a, and a great uh, advocate of, of uh, 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 his, his belief system. And uh, speaking of two people from the same neck of the woods, do you see anything miraculous with the Cubs winning the World Series? You know, isn't isn't that something? Uh, we're both from <laughs> Chicago, and uh, you know, I was convinced the Cubs were going to lose uh, up until the rain delay, and uh, there was a rain delay, and then they came back. And you know, uh, you just wonder. Uh, there are so many people in Chicago, and their families. My my wife, for example, her father and her her, her mother watched the Cubs uh, every single game. They knew all the players, they knew the averages, they knew everything, and they they passed along. You know, without seeing the Cubs win. And I think, you know, there's, there was, there was something there. I, th I think some spiritual baby, uh, Ron Sando was up there uh, tugging at the, at the, uh, uh, gown of, of God saying, we've got to win this world series. So I, th I think there was something, something, uh, uh, spiritual that happened with the Cubs. I can't guarantee that. And there's no scientific proof, but uh, something happened. And I think it was pretty special. <laughs> and uh, since the book is out, any experiences you've had or are other people, doctors coming out and say, hey, let's put on another book. Let's 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 make some more stories or sp let's share these stories. Yeah, I've had a number of doctors uh, come up to me now that the book is out. And, and what I've had also are the nurses are coming up to me and saying, you know, I've got some stories. You know, you ought to write a book about the, the nurses. And so I, I think that might be the next book would be the nurses uh, untold stories because uh, they they have uh, these goosebump uh, experiences also, and, and uh, I don't think I've, I've seen a book about uh, nurse uh, miracles. There are, there, there are a lot of miracle cures out there, uh, and I, I really think that, you know, I, I've read enough about miracle cures that they get a little boring. These are stories that are not miracle cures. These are miracles that happen in doctors' lives, and I think the nurses have them too, and I'd love to write a book. A nursing a book, and then this could this could go on to ministers and and uh, you know a whole host of of different uh, uh, occupations that that have been because uh, I think we we all are touched by by a, 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 the hand of God by a force that's higher than us that loves us that guides us that directs us to do to do uh, good things in this world. Yeah, I agree because sometimes. Uh... I, of course, have a curious mind. I want to understand why. Why are these spiritual forces doing what they're doing? Like that story, why was one guy spared, but the other guy died in the crash? But at the end of the day, it seems to be to the best thing we could have is to be an instrument of good, an instrument of our higher powers, so we can make a little difference here and there. I mean, as humans, that's really the best we can do. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. I think... Uh, uh, in in in, in uh, talking to the doctors, uh, what I found was that uh, doctors that were involved with some some good cause that that were inv that were really committed to do something uh, substantial, were always helped, always helped by by uh, some some uh, force by God. And um, in writing the book, I had a number of funny occurrences. Um, uh, I remember one time I was I was looking for. Uh, a doctor uh, that I I'd lost track of, and he'd retired, and he'd moved away, and and uh, I was really distressed. I, I I wanted to talk with him and get his story, and um, uh, after a few weeks, I'd forgotten about it, and I then was a, a funeral for one of the doctors in the in the in town, and and uh, I was standing in line, 
and who should walk through the door but this very doctor that I wanted to talk to. And uh, I was able to, to talk with him then and, and get his story. So uh, I thought that was a, an interesting coincidence. Another one that happened that was uh, interesting is that um, uh, I was looking for uh, someone to help me with the book, an agent or someone, and um, I thought I'd look up uh, Ben Carson uh, to see if uh, he would provide a story for me. And I, I looked under Ben Carson's site and looked at and he had some uh, his, some of his books were were on the site. And as I as I scrolled down the um, uh, the page, there appeared a picture of a person that I knew. And I said, I know that individual, and that was uh, an individual that was a patient of mine, who was the editor for Ben Carson's books. Was that was the uh, publisher, I should say, the president of the publishing house for Ben Carson's books. And so I thought, I've got to call him. I put a call into him and he said, oh, I'd love to help you with the book. Let's get together. And he's been my my kind of acting agent uh, ever since and has helped me tremendously in writing the book and getting the right connections, getting editors and so forth. And so what a coincidence that was that I, I bumped into his picture uh, just just by accident and probably not a coincidence at all. And there are a few other things that happened uh, in writing the book that that uh, made me made me think that you know uh, someone does care about uh, doing good in the world and, and helps those that are that are involved with worthwhile projects. I think. I would I would certainly agree, Scott. And for the listener, where where can they find more about uh, your information? We uh, the, the book is published through a division of Amazon, so it's available through Amazon.com. Uh, our website is physiciansuntoldstories.com. And um, it's also available through other, uh, uh, through Kindle and iBooks and so forth. But the main source that we're selling right now is, is through Amazon.com. And uh, you can log onto our website and get the additional information, physiciansuntoldstories.com. And if somebody wants to get a hold of you, like another doctor, and share their story? Uh, escobabmd at gmail.com. Escobabmd at gmail.com is my email address. Well, there you have it. Don't be shy. There's a lot of good stories to be shared with the world, or not enough good stories as far as I'm concerned. But I think that's all the time we have today, Scott. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on Aeon By and discussing your book, Physicians Untold Stories. It's been a pleasure, Miguel. Thank you.